Yes, good morning or afternoon. Uh, welcome to Saturday morning breakfast or afternoon, where, depending where you are. Uh, no so, breakfast. Yeah, this is a program of the First, uh, first Parish Church of Stowe and Acton, and we'll be recording today so that you'll be able to see this later on uh, Stowe TV. Um, so today we have Patty Miller of the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, where she's the uh, education outreach coordinator. But first, what I thought I'd do, we, we uh, have a question of the day normally, and we'll do this briefly. And the question is, what's your favorite island? And I'll ask you last, Patty before you do your your uh, presentation. So we'll start with Craig. He's always got good answers. What's your favorite island in the world? Um, well, before I get to the favorite island, I wanna tell you that my favorite lettuce right now is little leaf lettuce. Oh, good. That, <laughs> Patty, that was last last month's presentation. It was about little leaf lettuce. That stuff's that, that's pretty good lettuce. It is, it is definitely. Um, Okay, so my my favorite Hawaiian is is a Hawaiian island or no, just any, island in any island in the world? Oh, I don't know, boy, that's a tough one. Yeah, well, you can make it. A I guess I guess it would be Jamaica. That's that's where I I started scuba diving. So that was that was that was an interesting island for me. Oh, nice. Okay, how about Linda, my wife? <laughs> I'd have to say Putin Bay and Lake Erie because that's where I grew up, and that was always an adventure to go over to Putin Bay. Yeah. Okay. Rick, you got an answer? Favorite island anywhere? Yeah, and I think you know my answer. It's Monhegan <laughs> off yeah, the coast yeah. of Maine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And she she has an answer too. <laughs> England. England. Well, that's <laughs> a big island, but we'll, <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> Uh, Martha, what's your favorite island? Well, I guess right now it would be the Big Island. Big Island, okay. Yeah. And Re Rebecca, are you there to answer? She's yes. she only if I can get my computer to work. Um, I'm going to say Nantucket just because it's the only island that I've been to recently. <laughs> okay, well, that's decent. I'm going to say you can read my. Well, it's backwards, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Martha's Vineyard, I think, is my favorite island. Okay, Patty, um, what's your favorite island? And then you can uh, begin your presentation once I share my screen. Right behind. So it looks like everybody's favorite island is, is what you're familiar with and where you've been. Um, I've lived on both Oahu and Maui, and they're very different. I would pick this these two out of all of the Hawaiian islands if I was to live on one of them. And uh, just very different lifestyle. Maui's very laid back. So right now, my favorite island is Maui because I'm here. Yeah. So um, yeah. Okay. Um, but good morning, all. You want me to go ahead and start here? Um, yep. Like you said, I'm the education outreach coordinator for the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. And um, it was funny. We had a staff retreat this week, and one of the things that came up was we need to have a better name than what we have because it's way too long. Um, to uh, make people remember. But um, we are, um, I, like I said, I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator. We have people on all four islands uh, that do outreach and education. Maui is the main one where our main office, where we have a visitor center. We also have our research boat is here. And it's because most, the, the biggest population of whales um, in Hawaii is usually down here around Maui because it's calmer waters um, where they hang out more and we get more of the research and the entanglement and the things going on here. So, um, we, but we are based on all islands and I work with all islands on education outreach kind of things. Uh, do a lot of kid programs, a lot of adult programs. Our visitor center uh, brings in lectures and a lot of folks. It's interesting, Maui if um, and Jeff and Lynn have been on Maui, there's not a whole lot to do at night on Maui, like there is on Oahu. And when you go home on Maui, you, you don't mind going out again on Oahu. People don't want to go out again. But I find that people will come, the public comes to a lot more evening lectures and events 
um, here on Maui. So it, I find it to be a more environmentally um, conscientious island, really, or at least they're out there listening to things and participating than like Oahu. And again, because you don't want to drive on Oahu and we're limited here, so it's great. But anyway, let's go forward on this. Um, to talk, we're going to talk about whales today and see what you know about whales and see if we can teach you something. Next slide, Jeff. Um, there's our humpback whale. Kohola is the Hawaiian term for the whale. And this one is saying, hi, I'm here and uh, glad to meet you folks today doing a breach. This is an awesome thing to see. Um, they're actually not quite here yet. There's a few here, but not the population that will be here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, next slide. Um, we are part of uh, NOAA, which most people know NOAA as the weather service. Um, we are uh, part of the, well, the, the sanctuary system, well, we're, we're part of the Department of Commerce, let's put that up first. And then we are part of NOAA and then the sanctuary system. There are sanctuaries, we've got 13 of them. Um, and there are several, about three or four more that are being established and they're mostly around the Great Lakes and around the East Coast area right now that are coming on board. Um, all of the sanctuaries were created to protect some kind of unique um, marine environment. So we are all very different. Um, next one. Uh, we were designated by Congress in 1992. We are actually 30 years old this year. The whole sanctuary program is 50 years old, started 50 years ago. But those orange lines that you see are the real designated areas that are called um, our humpback whale territory. And you can see there around Maui and around um, Molokai and um, Lanai that our whole area is sanctuary waters. When they figured this out, they had a plane fly lowly over these islands and they counted the, they counted the whales. And the areas that they found the most whales in is where they designated um, specific areas to be within our um, boundaries. It, doesn't really make a whole lot of difference because the whales go from place to place and we protect them wherever they are. We can do a little bit more within the boundaries though areas than we can otherwise, but that's kind of why it was established that way. It may change. It's been, we've been had questions before of let's make it bigger, let's go farther. Um, it takes kind of an act of Congress to make that happen. So we like it the way it is. Um, next slide. Um, the whales, I love this slide go tend to go from um, north to south or north to north to the equator, south to the equator and back and forth. And what this is showing is that the whales now, the green ones on the top are pretty much where our um, Hawaiian Islands whales are. They go north to feed during the summer months and then they come down to the equator or the warmer waters where we are now for the winter. The ones in the south are doing the same thing. They are going they're feeding down in the cooler waters where there's food and then moving up uh, to the more towards the equator. Uh, next one. Um, the humpback whales used to be um, uh, listed as endangered in the last, I think it's the last three years. They have been um, marked now as depleted. Um, we are not, it no, we are no longer um, being the endangered species. Uh, this happened because the population has gone up. Um, on Kauai, the fishermen several years ago felt that the whales were interfering with their fishing, and which is not really true because it's not a whole lot of fish and the whales are not eating that kind of fish. They're not eating down here. But they started a petition. And with that petition, they got enough signatures that they got a real um, search of the whales here um, out in the Pacific area. And they did do a count of them and they found, which is great, the numbers are way up. So it changed it, they are depleted, but they have the same protection as they did as endangered. So it doesn't really matter because they are listed under the Endangered Species Act and they're protected in the same way. The one rule that we have is that you stay a hundred yards away from that whale whether you are on a kayak, you are surfing, you are on a whale watch boat, a cruise ship or whatever, you need to stay the 100 yards away from that whale. So it means that if you are in a boat and you're going forward and all of a sudden the whale pops up in front of you, you can't help that. You stop your boat and as long as you stop and you sit still, you're not in trouble. 
if you are approaching it, you see the whale. And unfortunately, we get a lot of the folks that want to get up and get the better pictures. They're going to go closer and closer, and they're going to go closer to that whale. It's as much for the human protection as it is for the um, whales. Uh, several years ago, there was a, a um, whale watch boat that went out from Oahu. They went out from the dock, doing exactly as they were supposed to, going very slowly. A whale pops up right in front of them. The, the boat hits the whale. The whale is 45 tons. It's a huge thing. The whale hits the boat. There was enough of a, of a, of a reaction there that the whale, uh, that the a child was sitting in his father's arms. This three-year-old went flying, hit his head on the uh, railing of the boat, and the kid actually died from it. There was enough of an impact with that. So it's, again, it's as much to save, to protect the people as the whales. The thousand feet by air is hard these days because of all the drones. And so there's new rules coming out about drone use and how they can use the drones and how close uh, you can get to it. But uh, we actually have what are called secret, we call them the secret police that get on the whale watch boats and are out on the water. And especially around here in Maui during whale season, they are a um, actually an officer um, type of group. They, they actually carry a gun. They can arrest these people. They can find them for going too close. So uh, folks do get stopped by them. It does help us keep the distance. And most of the boats are, it's the professional boats are staying away from them. It's more the kayakers and, and some of those folks that are going too close. But uh, we have what are called the condo police. And I don't know where Jeff and Linda, if you're looking out the window at the water, if you can see that the condo police are great because they see the people that are approaching the boats or the whales. If they can get pictures for us and especially a number on the boat, they call us, we report it and um, they uh, then go after them at least to talk to them. So um, again, the approach is as much for the safety as the people. So next one. Um, this again is talking about the distance here um, that I just went through and the reason for doing it. And if you can read what that whale says on the tail, then you are definitely too close to it. So um, <laughs> um, it's kind of cute if you can get up close enough to see the words on that on that tail, but again, keeping that 100 yards away from the whale. Next one. So we do education research and what's called resource protection. Um, let's start with the education and talk about the whale itself. You guys are back there on the East Coast. You get the whales. Don't know how much you know about them. We're gonna focus specifically on the um, humpbacks here, but let's go to the first one here. First question for you is, How big is a humpback whale? Wait a minute. Next no, slide. Says, why are they called humpback whales? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't read the top words. Why are they called humpbacks? Okay. <laughs> First, next one. This is a good question for you guys back there too. Okay. These guys are also called humpback whales because when they, the, the whale itself does not have a hump on its back. The usual question, answer is that it has a hump. I'm not going to work with that today. The, that the whale does not have a hump on its back but when the whale dives down underwater, it humps its back and it dives down, stays down about 15, 20 minutes and comes up again. They started calling them the humpbacks. The right whales, which you guys have back there on the East Coast, were called the named the right whales because in the old whaling days, the whaling guys would go, that's the right one, go get it. And they started calling them the right whales. And so that's the common name of your right whales. That's how they got the name. Ours got the humpback because they swim along, they hump the back and they go underwater. So um, kind of cool story there. Yep, next one. This one is how big is an adult humpback whale? Okay, whales are huge. Um, they are, I think the next one is a really great example of what this is. They are about 40 to 50 feet long. They weigh about 40 to 50 tons. And I love this picture because it shows the, um, the picture there of the of the human being that's you compared to the whale and what it would be like to get flipped up in the air with a tail from that for kids this is a great one it's about the size of a big school bus that is there we actually have an inflatable life-size humpback whale we only have one room at our facility where we can blow it up blow it up you can go inside this whale you can see it's got three stomachs i never knew a whale had three stomachs just like a cow um, you can see the baleen, but um, it really gives the perspective of how huge these things are. And when I first started uh, teaching with these guys, I thought, I need to know how to draw one of these. And I look carefully at the whale. This whale is not quite in perspective. 
but when the actual whale, the tail or the uh, flukes are about 15 feet wide, about 15 feet long. The mouth of the whale is about 15 feet long, huge oh mouth. God. It has a tongue the size of a small car. So one third of the whale is the mouth, about a third is the body there, and then you have the tail. The, uh, the flippers on the side are actually 15 feet long also. So I've got a drawing thing that I do with the kids, but it's, I've never, I've been able to, been looking at other dolphins and other animals have not been able to see that. But this guy is very proportional, 15, 15, 15, kind of interesting. And you're gonna see more of this mouth as we go on. The okay, next one. Okay, they breathe air. You can keep clicking here. Humpback whales actually have two blowholes Baleen animals and baleen, uh, they have baleen, what's called baleen instead of teeth, and I'm going to show you some of that in a minute. Um, baleen animals have two blowholes. Um, if they are toothed mammals, they only have one, and I don't know what the difference is between that. Um, when they come up out of the air, or come up out of water, obviously they're blowing the air out of those blowholes. Um, next one here, and then when they go into water, they close them. So here's a challenge for you and you click it again, is to, can you close your nostrils without touching them? And so this was kind of funny. Of course, the kids love to do this. I did this with some adults about a month ago, and this guy goes, I can do that. He said, I'm a surfer. So when I dive underwater, he said, I'm able to get my upper lip to come up and close off my nostrils. So when I dive underwater, all I have to do is that, and I don't get water up my nose as I go underwater. So a very few people have I I've tried this with it, been able to do it, but again, it's a challenge of the day. So we're not going to ask how many of you guys can do that. So when the blow comes out, it comes out at about 300 miles an hour. It's a real whoosh, and you can hear it from shore. Um, it also tends to have a smell to it. I was up in Alaska, and it would be like, to me, it was like overcooked kind of rotten broccoli. It was a really kind of a foul smell that would come out, kind of like it's burping. Um, but it's one way that you do see the whales as um, from shore, from a boat, it's one way of recognizing them. They actually collect that moist air and they do that with a drone. Today they can do it with a drone by flying a drone over it if that opportunity um, comes up. And they are collecting that and from that they can uh, collect some DNA sampling and other things that talk about the health of the whales. So, uh, they used to go up closer to the whales, the researchers that could, and they had a long pole with a cup on the end, and they would hold it out and try to collect that moisture where technology has helped to bring the drones in to be able to do it. But um, that's that's the blow. Next one. Um, the feeding is, this is really cool. These are birds. And this is a picture up in Alaska. You know, the whales do not he eat down here in Hawaii. There, We do not have food for them. Uh, they eat while they're in Alaska, and the birds obviously are aware of what the whales are doing here and have come in to take the opportunity to catch some of that fish and krill that's coming up to the surface. Well, the next one tells us a little bit more about the feeding. Okay, this is the baleen I was talking about. They have uh, this baleen. It's like plates. There's like 200 of them that hang down from the roof of the mouth. They're about six to eight feet long on a humpback whale, humpback whale. They have little hairs on the edge, which you can see it on that left-hand side there. Yeah, they're really long. Well, remember that mouth is 50, well, you're gonna see the big mouth open too. That mouth is 15 feet long. These, um, they've got the hairs on the outside of those. And when they open that mouth, they take in that gulp of water, they trap all the little fish and krill, that's the little tiny things on those hairs and then they take their giant tongue, which again is the size of a small car, they swirl it around in the mouth, brushing off all that fish and krill and put it down the throat. Now the back of the throat, remember this whale is huge. The back of the throat is about this big. It's about the size of a dryer hose. Very small, small hole in the back of the throat. This is not Jonah the whale, cannot swallow you, could not swallow a shark, could not swallow a bird, anything that's big only that's big enough that can go down that little dryer hose type of size. Let's take a look at the next one, and I think we get a better image of this. What This is what they're eating mostly. They'll eat little um, sardines, little fish. 
but mostly they eat the krill. And the picture down on the bottom where there's a finger and there's a little thing on top of it shows you the, how big it is, that's krill. And all of the pink in that picture above is just solid krill that's on the ground up there. This um, uh, grows in cold waters. This is why they go both north and south to feed. Um, obviously hundreds of thousands of them. A whale will, each whale will eat about a ton of this stuff a day. So it tells you oh how much God. food it needs to be there. A couple of years ago, um, we had, a, the whales were really late coming down and they didn't come down. Not as many came as usual. And they felt that climate change was starting to kind of maybe change things. The temperatures were warming in Alaska. They weren't, there wasn't as much food there. So they ate what they could, but then they went somewhere else to feed before coming down here. Uh, the last couple of years though, that has not happened. So maybe the uh, waters have cooled a little bit more and the fish population is up. The bottom picture is starting to show you how big that mouth is. Now they have these pleats. When you look at that picture, there's pleats on the underside of the jaw. That's like uh, like a fan. And it opened, when you were a kid and you made the paper fans and you put them together and open them up. That's what the jaw does. It opens up way, way wide. It has the ability to do that. And remember again, this is one third the size of the body. So that's at least 15 feet long. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. And when they feed, this is really cool. They make what's called a bubble net. And they will swim around and around and around and around in a circle. And think about what they're doing. You know, they, they have come across a, a clump of krill and sardines and little fish. They know it's there. They're swimming around and around and around. And what they're doing is collecting all of those into one big clump. With kids, I'll take a, a, a jar of like water with pepper in it. And you take a stick and you go around and around and that pepper represents the little fish and it clumps it together. So what they've done is clump it together, but they're blowing bubbles the whole time as they're going around and around. So that bubble net is actually what they're doing, trapping all that little fish together. You'll have, oh, five, 10 whales working this together, this system. Um, the, um, oh, I was up in Alaska and we were filming them several years ago. It was the coolest experience because we came up in the boat, the driver stopped the boat right in front of the whales. I don't know how he knew he could hear them when they're feeding, they're howling, a very different thing than when they sing their songs, but they were howling like a ghostly howl. And he put a hydrophone in the water, could hear him, and he stops the boat. And the whales start this giant circle, and they're blowing bubbles. It's going counterclockwise all the time. And these big, huge bubbles come to shore right in front of our boat, luckily, which you'll see why in a minute when you see the video. And they closed in the circle, and it got quiet. And then all of a sudden, they come to the surface with their mouths open, taking a gulp of this food. And then about 15 minutes later, or they sunk back down. About 15 minutes later, they started it, doing it again. We watched it for about four hours, just sitting there watching this thing over and over again of this feeding process. So we'll take a look at the next one, I think, is the video that shows you how they do this. Oh, no, this is just the mouth. Look at that bottom jaw. The things that are going out to the side up by the white of the, under, of the whale is the peck fins. Those are the fins. That jaw, that's just a huge, it can open up huge, huge wide. We go to the next one. And those are the bubble nets. Okay, there's the mouth open filled with, you see that the baleen that's there on the right hand side, and you see all the little fish and krill that's there, and he's gonna stuff that down that little, I wonder how it doesn't get clumped in that back of that throat, but he stuffs it all down that throat. He spits out the water. Okay, next one. Okay, this is actual, Feeding, that's the fish swimming along. Here the whales are coming out. That's the open mouth. Clumping down, it's taking a gulp of water. It's spitting out that water. This was so cool to watch. Amazing animals, and they're so huge. There were probably 10 of them in this group. Wow. I wanna know why they don't land on each other. Yeah. As they probably do. But again, they come up, took this huge gulp, and then they sunk down and they started that bubble circle again. You wanna watch, okay. Um, that one was, um, as the whales were there, we watched them come up to the surface at one point. They quit the howling, came up to the surface and started going off to the side a little bit. And we could see another pot of whales way over on the other side of the bay. This is up in Alaska. Our whales chased them away. It's like that other pod heard our whales howling. They knew, it's like, oh, there's a restaurant over here. They got food, let's come. 
They started over. Our whales chased them away. The other guys turned around, left, and our guys went back down and continued feeding. It was so cool. Um, really neat experience. That's up in Glacier Bay. And so if you take a cruise up in Alaska or you're up there, in Glacier Bay area, you have the opportunity of sometimes being able to actually see that. It, it's really awesome. So this, again, is just another part of the migration shows where the whales are going. The orange is where ours are going from Alaska down to us. Um, you get some on the West Coast and some over towards Japan and the Philippines, down towards Australia. Next one. Um, they, this is their migration. And it's like how, I want to know how in the world do they know where they're going. But they go back and forth between Alaska and us. Um, about 3,000 miles, takes them about four to six weeks. Um, we tend to see um, either a very pregnant mom come down first or a mom and a young kid. They tend to give birth down here in Hawaii. Uh, a couple of reasons, there's less predators down here than they have in Alaska. And also the, um, you know, when the whales eat all that food, they're eating a ton a day of it. Um, they're storing that that food as, that's what blubber is. They're storing it as fat. That blubber is in their body. It keeps them warm. It's also the storage of food that they work off of all the time they're down here because they don't eat so that they're basically using that blubber to live on. The newborn babies don't have any blubber. They have no way at first of protecting themselves from the cold. So by the time they're down here for a couple of months, they've eaten enough from nursing with the mom that they have a little bit of their own blubber as they go back up to Alaska. So a couple of reasons why the babies tend to get born down here. Okay, next one. This one, I love this picture. There's your baby fluke and your mom fluke are the tails. Um, the babies again, 15 feet when they're born again to this proportion thing. Don't know why. So females that have had children, just imagine what that's like. And um, they nurse from the mom. A really interesting, a whale does not have nipples. They have a slit and somehow that baby knows how to go up the whale's like this, goes up, touches that slit, nudges it, hangs down below, and the whale, it's like a faucet, squirts the mud, squirts the milk just out of the uh -huh. out, of, out of her and into that into that baby whale. It's very thick in milk fat, so it takes it a while to, to um, dilute in the ocean water, but that's how the babies um, are feeding. Think of that poor mom is not feeding also while she's here, but she's feeding that baby. Um, but interesting fact, our guys have been actually able to been re able to record some of that nursing behavior with the babies. Um, but the mom tends to, she protects that baby. I think the next slide talks about her life cycle with the kid. Um, yeah, uh, you know, they, they, um, they mate when they're down here in Alaska. I mean, I'm sorry, in Hawaii. They go back to Alaska, they feed, they come back down here and give birth. The mom then takes the baby at the end of the season here, takes the baby back to Alaska, teaches it how to feed. Then the baby comes back. It's now kind of a teenager, comes back to um, Hawaii with the mom and then goes, okay, I'm a big kid. I'm going to go play with the big kids, leaves the mom and goes away. And the cycle starts all over. So the mom is really with that child for about a year. That's kind of the, the oh, uh, cycle. Very, very cool. Yeah. Next one. How to spot a whale. Okay. If you're out here and those of you that are coming out here, um, there can be several things you're going to see. You're going to see the blow. You're going to see that peck fin. They'll sit. They, to me, it's like they're waving. They slap it and slap it up and down and up and down. The tail also goes up and down. It's exercising. It's playing. They say they are very playful when they're down here. A lot more of these behaviors here than up in Alaska. Um, the, the, the spy hop is kind of cool. It's like he's coming up, bringing his head up. They'll go around in a circle looking for what's out there. Um, but the real interesting one here is this head lunge. And these are two males in the back. The front one is a female. And these guys are fighting over who's going to become the boyfriend of this female. Let's go to the next picture. And they, um, it's like the survival of the fittest. And here you can see them. They, they land on top. They're, remember, they're 45 tons. They're landing on top of each other. They're fighting for that position with that female. Now, it's survival of the fittest. One of them then will give up and go away. Next picture, I think, shows that there's probably... No, this one just just showing. They actually draw blood. They pull skin off of each other. They are fighting. And from shore, 
we can see this. And when our, our research guys are out there, um, they see this behavior quite often here in Hawaii. And it's a lot of splashing, a whole lot of splashing that's going on as you see them fighting. And they go on for hours and hours because the one guy survives. And then the next one, I think is what I want to see of all. This is all the whales underwater yep. that were waiting to have their turn to fight for that position with that female. So the next one, I don't know how, there must be an order down there. The next one will come to surface, will fight with that male, and then one of them will go away. And then in the end, next picture here, the um, again, here's the fighting of it. They're landing on each other. And in the end, the female goes, I'm not interested at all. You guys have just been playing. And so she takes off and runs away. I love that story. So, um, <laughs> all right. So now that's kind of the basics of the humpback whale. And I know you guys might have questions. We'll take time for that in a few minutes. But I want to go a little bit about how in the world do you study a humpback whale? You know, I'll have people call and go, so where are the, where are the, you know, the, the places where you keep the whales? Where, where are your, your, you keep them in captivity. It's like, no, these are 45 feet long. You can't not keep these in captivity. It doesn't work. So how do you go about doing this? So next one here. So our research, go ahead to the next one. They've got several things that they're doing. One thing is that, and this is all with special government permits to be up close to the whales. This is, they put tags, satellite tags on the whales. And for several different reasons. One is if a whale becomes entangled in fishing gear and our guys want to um, disentangle it and they need to follow it for a while until it gets tired, they will put a tag on it so they can go back and find it later. If it's late in the afternoon or the water's too rough, they will put a tag on it. So on the end of the pole is a satellite tag, um, stays on, so it depends on the activity of the whale, how long it stays on. But if it's at nighttime, then by the next morning, they can go back and find where this whale is. The tag comes off, floats in the water, sends up a beeping sound, and they go out and collect the tags. They are expensive, so they'll go back and find them. Next picture shows you what the tag looks like. Um, it's just that little orange thing on them. Whale doesn't know it's there, but it's a way of tracking them. Um, they're doing it also just to see where the whales are going, and they're following behaviors with them. Um, they now have, along with those tags, uh, the whales are going deep. Uh, they'll be able to go underwater and follow them. This last year has been really cool stuff to see where they're seeing the whales underwater. They're getting video and sounds of what the whales are doing underwater. And it's coming from that device that is recording those behaviors underwater. So they're learning a lot more about them. Next picture. They also have what's called an arm which is a long pole with a um, camera that goes off the side of the boat. You know, they can't get in the water close to the whales. It's not safe, but they're able to put this arm down and are able to take a look up close at the whale. Um, they are looking for scars. They're looking for injuries on the whales. Um, they're measuring the size of the whale, but it has increased greatly what they are learning about the whales by able being able to be underwater more with this. So it's a special special camera that's underwater. Also can record sounds. Next one. Um, well, here's your arm again, doing again what they're doing. And then they're doing acoustical monitoring. So this device goes down underwater. They have them in several places around the Hawaiian Islands where they have put these down. They've even down for like three months at a time. They record, these record only the sounds of the whales and what they've been able to do. Every whale has a little different sound to them. So we had this poor intern last summer that sat and just listened to these sounds that come out of this, these hours of sounds. And you can recognize how many whales have gone over this particular device. And they can also get somewhat of a timing of when this is happening. So that they, it's one way they're able to evaluate how many whales are here. Um, they're now putting these down in the coral reefs also to start recording behavior and things in the, in, within the coral reefs, but um, really kind of a cool thing. We got great whale sounds. Uh, next one. Can you hear the singing? Yeah. I can't hear that, but the, the oh, whale... I the, I can hear it. Huh. Yeah, it's weird. I can't. It's okay. Only the males sing. 
and they only they sing they got to be upside down in the water when they actually sing they have a song and each year that song changes a little bit and the song will be uh, patterns would be like la 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 different patterns and that pattern changes they record they put hydrophones in the water record these songs and every year that song changes a little bit there is a lead whale the conductor in the pacific this is the same through all the pacific sing the same song that somehow that changes and over about five years the whole song completely changes so there's definitely a song that they sing again it's the males the all whales, though, will they will vocalize when they're feeding. Um, they'll be making sounds, but the actual songs are a different thing. Um, interesting how they've been able to follow that. Again, I'm going to be that lead whale. Um, next one. Okay, they do a lot of, we do a lot of um, recording just where whales are seen. And all of the, that's done from a boat that's out there weekly and from shore from the same spot, they do the same transect areas to count how many whales are there each year. So all of those colored dots represent a different year. This is right off of Lahaina, off of the coast. And this is how many whales have been sighted in those years. Um, they get a position where they are and record that. And it's another way of telling how many whales are here trying to keep track of populations. Next one. So one thing they look at to identify a whale um, is by the pattern on its tail. Um, all whales have a different pattern. It might be a little different shape. It's got a different coloration to it. Uh, the markings are different on it. The researchers will be out there on the boat. The boat's going like this. The whale's going like this. And somehow when that whale comes up, they've got to snap that picture of that tail. They have thousands of images of whale tails. Um, again, the interns, they pay their dues, they sit at their computers and look at those tails and match them um, from all the other whale tails that are seen out there to see if it's a new whale they're seeing down here. A dolphin, they can look at the um, dorsal fin of the dolphin and they can, that's how they identify those guys. They can do that with a computer. Then for some reason, they cannot do this with a computer, they're working on it, but um, it's a task of identifying these guys they do not name them. They will give them a, except for a few of the whales they want to use for creative purposes, they're just given a number. But it's the way they identify them. I was on a boat up in Alaska when we were filming the whales, and the researcher that was with me got so excited because she recognized the same whale from up here or from down here that she was seeing up in Alaska at that time. So, um, But it's recognizing those fluke patterns on those tails. Next one. Um, we use drones, and this is fairly new in the last couple of years where they've got into really using the drones and they're getting much more sophisticated with, they, with what they can do. They can get up close to the whale and really see from the surface where that arm is doing the underwater evaluation. The drone is flying and figuring out what's going on underwater there, I mean, from the surface. So um, lots of reasons for those drones and a great new tool that they can use. Next one. And one of the um, main things that we do down here besides all the research is unfortunately the disentanglement of the whales. We are well known for that. One of our staff uh, trains people all over the teams all over the world to do that. And unfortunately when the whales swim down from Alaska, they get caught in lost fishing gear. Um, one, one whale came down with a crab pot attached to a big crab pot. Oh they swim through the ropes and things, they get entangled in this. And we're going to show you here how they disentangle that. You know, our guys will get a call. The people that see them first are your whale watch boats that are out there usually because they're out in the water all the time. They will see um, the whale with uh, a buoy attached to it or rope around it or something. They call. We have teams ready to go on every island. And they will jump. Ed, if he can, will fly to that island depending on the situation. They are ready to go out and disentangle these whales to free them. So we're going to show you how they do this. Let's see what's next here. Um, the threats are, again, the orcas, the whales, and the sharks. Not so much down, somewhat down here. A um, lot more up in Alaska. Our main one down here, main things are entanglement and vessel collisions, where you can see that whale on the bottom ran into a rudder of a boat. But the entanglement, that whale is pulling along these buoys and things. 
it keeps the whale from getting, going, being able to go underwater to feed, um, slows them down. They are more approachable than by predators. Um, probably not going to survive long if they have a whole lot of this on them. So next one. Um, shows again just up close what it is. And I think the next one is the actual video here. Oh, no. This is in the last, what, 20 years? The number of reports, they freed 151 animals. Um, some years are a lot more than others and do not know why. We've had a couple of reports already this year. There was one yesterday. But yesterday, for some reason, the rope was through the whale's mouth and they somebody saw and actually got a picture of it. The whale opened its mouth, the rope came right out, and it just swam away. So it took care of itself. It was a good one. Um, next one. So here is a video. I'm going to be quiet here. Thirty. Wow. Pretty cool. Twelve This is called um, an Earth is Blue video, and Noah has a bunch of these. If you just Google Earth is Blue videos, they have a whole bunch of these on different animals and different things that Noah does. It's kind of cool to see if you're interested in getting into these. So again, Earth is Blue. This is some of the rope that was taken off of one of the whales. Um, one whale got stuck real close into shore here on Maui in cabling, like cabling for TVs and um, that kind of cable that is a big heavy metal cable. They could not cut it loose. Our guys <laughs> called the Coast Guard, said, we need help. Will you bring us a, a wire cutter, a metal you know, wire cutter thing? Coast Guard runs to the local hardware store, grabs, they gave it to them free, gave them the metal uh, cutters. They ran out to the boat that was really close actually to where the hardware store was, cut the whale free. So it was kind of a community effort, but most of it is rope like this in a lot of different sizes. Um, you know, the boats are not letting it go. They don't want to lose it on their own, but it, it happens. So anyway, uh, folks, that is, I think, the end of what I have got here for you. And I hope you learned something and um, got any questions. I'm happy to take them or you can always email me the things. And if you come to Maui, come visit us and learn more about what we do and visit our visitor center. Boy, that was that was terrific. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, wow. I, had, I, I had a question relative to the, the thousand foot uh, air space given to the to the whales. How did 
how does airspace endanger uh, the whales? You know, the way, uh, it, that was set 30 years ago, and that was just for flying airplanes. I, it was mainly for the noise oh. of, of interacting with them. Now it's the drones. Drones can just get up too close to the whales. But it was established. The first thing was it was noise interfering with the whales. And, yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because there's that, that's a tough one. But that was what they said at that time. It makes more sense now with the drones to keep the drones away. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Martha, go ahead. Yeah. Um, do you know, do you have any relationship with the people who, who are doing Boston Harbor? For whales? Um, we know the sanctuary that's back there. They are mm -hmm. one of our sister sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Um, they're one of our program. Uh, Dave Matilla, I don't know if you know and Dave Matilla, started work back there 30 years ago with mm -hmm. um, the disentanglement program. Did you know Dave? Or know I don't know him, but I've seen a couple of shows about um, also they were, what they were doing was uh, trying to make sure the tankers didn't go yes. where the whales went. Yeah. Because that, they were hitting the whales. Right. That area, that, that, and that's one of the main things that sanctuary does. They are right in the middle of those whales are going right through those main East coast shipping lines. And so they're trying to um, navigate how they eliminate that, you know, out here, we don't have that kind of problem. We just have our local cruise ships and our, our um, boats that are bringing things to our to our islands that they know to go slow in whale season and they're watching out for that that they do hit them but nothing like what the east coast has and so they've actually tried to find where the whales the populations are there and make it be that that's not that the shipping lines can't go through those areas um, it's a real problem back there yeah you have a whole different situation yes yeah yeah go ahead other question. Uh, hi, um, I lived in the South Pacific for three years, and I'm wondering is the are the humpbacks down there around Tonga and Fiji and Samoa a whole different fleet of humpbacks? Yes, they are the in fact, our guys um, tend to go down to Samoa and work and we have a sister sanctuary in Samoa and go down there. Those are the ones that go from there down to um, down to the Arctic to Antarctica area to feed. So they're going south from there, but yes, different population from what we have here in Hawaii. Yeah. Me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> any, any other questions? Re Rebecca, why don't you tell us what you told me earlier, what you had done and earlier work experience. Yeah, so I, I was one of the interns, you kept referring to the interns doing a, <laughs> looking at the whale tails. I did an internship with um, what was then called the Cetacean Research Unit. It's now the Whale Center of New England. And my job was to track, take notes as we did whale watch um, research trips on behaviors. And so my first three months, I actually did a lot of darkroom work because the whales weren't in our area yet. Um, so I was developing all the pictures of the flukes for the previous year so that we could then go and identify all the whales. Yep. And then after that, I once we were actually doing the research trips, my job was to take the notes. And when that when Patty referred to the whale breath, it, it really does stink. And it's really bad for camera lenses. So if you oh, go on a whale watch <laughs> trip and you're getting good close to boat activity, just be careful because when they exhale, that's really not good for your camera lenses. Um, so, so I saw a lot of the behaviors that she was talking about in Alaska, pretty yeah. much. If you go see a whale watching trip anywhere out of Massachusetts, they're all going to the same place. They're all going to Stellwagen Bank. Yes. And what Stellwagen Bank is, is it's a long elevated portion under the ocean. And because it's only about a hundred feet deep at the main part of the bank, we get a lot of, um, sunlight coming in with the cold water coming up and that allows the, the plankton to grow like crazy. Our whales don't actually eat the plankton. What they eat are these little fish about this big called sand lamps. 
but the sand lamps eat the plankton. So that's why stalagmite banks are really important feeding ground in our area. And as she said, it there's a shipping lane that goes right past it. And so we have a ton. That's where we lose a lot of our right whales. We lose a lot of humpbacks too, but you know yeah. we have both. Yeah. So, yeah, I could answer any other questions about our area, but that's the basics. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks. the life of an intern. And what's interesting is that you were developing the pictures. It wasn't digital. What you know, right. it's what what has changed over time, and just this last you know thirty years, technology has changed so much of what of what is done. I had a gentleman come in yesterday to talk to us about. He's they're developing a. They've been working with the oil companies, and they've got this robot that they put deep on the ocean floor and can collect all kinds of information about water quality issues and they can pick up samples on the floor and whatever. And they were doing it so they were paid by the oil companies to see is, are they dropping oil on the green, you know, what's happening there. But he wanted to do something with the whales. And his thing was, he said, one thing they want to do is see how much whale poop they can collect. And they're doing a study on that. It's like, Okay, this is an interesting one to want to do. So, um, you know, they're out there looking at everything there. Um, yeah. yeah. I would think you would have to do that at the surface. I don't know. Every now and then you you, you see a whale slick <laughs> yeah, in, it, in our area when they're feeding, you know. So, yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah. I just, I started my internship. It was literally about 30 years ago. Hydrophones were, were just starting to be yes. inexpensive enough for us to use in our research. Yes. So, yeah, things have changed a lot. <laughs> yeah, big time, big time. So, um, yeah, funny. There was one lady out here years ago that she wanted, she put in for um, funding to collect different colors of ocean water. So he wanted, she wanted to be on a ship where she could collect the different colors of the ocean water. You know, from shore, you'll see some days it's different colors. That was an interesting research question that came up. She did not get funded. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Question? Yeah. No, I think I, I have I have, I have one one other question, Patty. When you first started, it was it was good news that the whales were no longer endangered; they were depleted. So no. Oh. When I started thirty years, they were they were endangered. No, no. But, but just recently, you said that they right, I, recently I they are de right. Yes. Right. So. So that, that would imply to me that there are actual numbers, ranges that, that, that fall, that if you have a certain count, you fall into that category. How, for, for endangered whales, they've got to be okay. less than how many population or what? How, how does that work? Uh, that's a great question. I do not know. That's a great question. I don't know what got them down to that number at all. And you know, of course, it's the whaling going away, which has helped that. You know, that's a great question. I need to figure that one out. But but Why now now they're whaling? depleted, right? So somebody somebody counted uh, yes. additional counts, um, additional whales. So there's more. Yes, they okay. did, they pick the counts around the Pacific area, and so it's not just Hawaii, but it's going over towards you know Japan and the Philippines, and so somehow they got a um, an accounting from those areas. I need to go ask that question. I do not know. Oh, okay. We didn't want them to become, we, we like to be endangered. Um, oh, okay. But luckily they are treated the same way. I do not know that answer. Sorry, great question. Well, Patty, thank, thank you very much. This has been a tremendous presentation. And, and thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for being there guys. And oh, yeah. uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. It looks Thank like you. the weather's better in Hawaii than here. Yes. Thank you for reminding <laughs> yes, us there's warm is. weather. Right. <laughs>